Hi, let's take a look at determining crystallographic planes and we're going to use a set of numbers similar to what's done in directions except we call them Miller indices and they're determined differently obviously because they're describing a plane. <clears throat> so the process is going to start by uh, remembering that you can translate a plane if necessary and it doesn't change the plane as long as it's parallel to the original and that's what translation implies we're translating it parallel to the original um, <clears throat> but we have to do this step um, if the plane crosses through our origin translate plane so origin uh, is not on the plane of course another way of stating that same uh, same fact is you could define a new origin. You can define a new origin that's not on the plane. The origin is your tool to work with, to use, to make your life easier. <clears throat> um, so we d once we've done that, then we can determine distance to intercept. plane by traveling along each axis along each axis from the origin and then at, th at this in this step you have to realize that you may have infinity introduced if the, par if the plane is parallel to one of the axes, you could travel infinitely far along that axis and never intercept the plane. So we've got infinity in there. We're kind of funny people in material science. We, we like to keep you know, notation in a very specific way. And in fit well, fractions, we don't like fractions. You'll know that or, uh, from directions. And uh, infinity signs are pesky. They use up a lot of space. We would rather express it as zero. How do you make infinity into zero? Take the reciprocal. So we take the reciprocal uh, each and every time. Okay, and, and even if the infinity, if there's no infinity in the particular plane that, you, that you're working with, you still take the reciprocal to be consistent. So you take the reciprocal, um, and then we enclose in parentheses. And often we just use the placeholder letters H, K, and L to refer to general Miller indices for a plane. If there's any negative signs, we move them over the top, uh, like what we do for directions. And I'll write that down just to be complete. Negatives go above and no commas. No commas. All right, good. So let's take a look at a plane. Let's take a look at my all-time favorite plane. This plane here cuts off the back bottom left corner of the cube. So we can actually, in this case, start with this conventional origin as our origin. So what we're going to do is I'm going to proceed through in this uh, same order here. I'm going to determine the intercept. I'm going to <coughs> take the reciprocal, and then I'm going to enclose. OK, so we're going to do that. We're going <coughs> to determine the intercept, take the reciprocal, and then we're going to enclose for x, y, and z. So from this origin here, we travel 1 in the x direction. We would travel from that origin one in the y direction to hit the plane. And from this origin here, we would travel one in the z direction and hit the plane. There's no reductions necessary. And the enclosure then becomes one, one, one. This is the one, one, one plane. What about if we take a look at um, another, another plane over here? Perhaps, um, perhaps this plane right here. All right, so this plane 
crosses through the y-axis at half of the lattice parameter in the y direction. <coughs> so again, we're going to go systematically. I mean, there are shortcuts you can take, but let's do it systematically at first. Inter uh, intercept reciprocal uh, enclosure. <coughs> I actually missed a step, um, and that would be reduction. And it's going to be important on this step here, reduction and then enclosure. So uh, again, we can start with this conventional origin. We would travel one uh, in, the y, in the x direction, y and z. We would travel a half lattice parameter in the y, one half. And how far would we travel to z? Well, it's actually parallel to z. So we would travel infinitely far. So a reciprocal gives us 1, 2, 0. Um, the, the reciprocal is taking care of the uh, reduction, actually. Sorry, I should have thought of that. So we didn't need to, to do that extra reduction step. If we had needed to, we would have cleared the fraction just by multiplying across by the lowest common denominator. And so the enclosure then becomes 1, 2, 0. That's the 1, 2, 0 plane. <coughs> Finally, we could look at families of planes. And these are planes that look the same in two dimensions. They've got the same atoms in the same positions. They would have the same linear packing fraction. So for example, um, you know, the, the faces of a cube, well, the faces of the cube are <coughs> this front face is the 0, um, sorry, correction, it's the 1, 0, 0. You can see the zeros in the x and the, uh, sorry, in the y and the z positions tell you it's parallel to y and z. It's actually in the y, z plane. It crosses through um, only the x axis. Um, <clears throat> so that specific plane is 1, 0, 0. This side over here would look the same. Pick a crystal structure, FCC, BCC. You draw it in two dimensions, simple cubic. Draw it in two dimensions. For that specific crystal system that you've picked, the atoms will look the same, the, the plane will look the same in two dimensions. And so that makes it part of the same family of planes. This plane over here specifically is 0, 1, 0. And of course, the top is 0, 0, 1. <clears throat> Together, we would call all of those the 0, 0, 1 family of planes. And for this cube, there's actually only three specific planes in the 0, 0, 1 family of planes. We've moved the zeros to the, to the left-hand side, the non-zero values to the right, and <coughs> reduced the number of negative signs. Um, in, in fact, there's no significance here to negative signs. You multiply a plane by negative 1, it's the same plane. So if you can multiply by negative 1 and reduce the number of negative signs with a plane, you do it. Um, all right, that's it. Thank you very much.